As uh, we're preparing for the message, I just want to let you know that we're uh, intentionally moving forward with our discipleship process here at MAC, and uh, we are coming, uh, this isn't quite solidified yet, but we're landing on a graphic that uh, represents that, and uh, we have four different uh, quadrants, if you will, that we are recognizing that people need to learn to know the Lord come into saving a relationship and knowledge of Jesus uh, as Savior and Lord in their life. From there, we need to grow in our relationship with God, uh, growing deep uh, roots into the soil and then growing up and out. From there, we need uh, to learn how to serve on the, uh, based on the gifts and passions that God has given to us. And then we uh, begin to live a life uh, where we sow the seeds of the gospel. We're sharing the good news. And uh, this is something that's uh, a lifelong process that we grow through, but it's also something that we're involved in every day and every week. So thank you for being here. Uh, We need to know the Lord and be involved in corporate worship. And we also want to know the Lord uh, on a daily basis of being with Him in prayer. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the message today. We also want to grow in the Lord and want to intentionally uh, place ourselves where we can uh, uh, hear learn, uh, take on the the character and model uh, of the life of Jesus. There's a lot of opportunities uh, during Mac at 943. Hopefully you're learning about that in the foyer. One thing that I just want to let you guys know about, uh, John and Rebecca Huffman are going to be leading a a discussion group immediately after this service, starting next week. It's a discussion of the uh, sermon passage that we just talked about. And uh, they'll be doing that, and uh, we'll be letting you know more about that. But that's uh, one way that you can grow. And then obviously we talked about pumpkin patch, it's a way to serve, and then uh, mission trips would be a place to share. But we'll be uh, uh, letting you know more about the discipleship process and uh, what we're uh, growing as a culture uh, to uh, know, grow, serve, and uh, sow. Well now for the message. We are uh, in a series of messages entitled Back to School, reminding ourselves of the basics of prayer by looking at the model that Jesus provided and the way that he prayed. I went to school in the 70s. Uh, There's probably people out there, children of the 70s and 80s like myself. Uh, There was an emphasis on the three R's when I was in school, and they necessarily didn't start with R. Does anybody remember the three R's? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. They don't start with R. But the reading... We, uh, we learned with uh, primers that included names like Sally, Dick, Jane, and Spot the dog. Anybody with me? Yeah, all right. More over here than over here. Uh, look, Dick, see Sally and Tim. Funny, funny, Sally, funny, funny, Tim. Uh, it's a wonder that we learned how to read at all. <laughs> Writing, taking that pencil in our hand, learning how to hold it in such a manner that we could write, and the graph or or the line paper that had the solid line and then the dotted line, and you had to make your uh, small letters and have them fit on the dotted line, and the the capital letters went all the way to the top. And then in second grade, we learned cursive. We learned how to make our our, uh, letters curved. Arithmetic, we learned to add, subtract, divide, and multiply, learning times tables. And I remember those days in August. It's always hot. No air conditioning, and uh, it, your uh, arm would be filled with sweat, and the paper would stick to your arm. I remember lunch. Lunch, uh, you'd, lunch money at the beginning, uh, and if you wanted an extra milk, it was five cents. And on Saturdays, or on Fridays, if you wanted a chocolate milk, you brought six cents. Those were, those were the days. It's interesting that Four uh, pastors at Mac have four kids going to school for the first time, at least at a, a different stage. Um, Robbie and Julianne are sending Micah to the Kindergarten Wolves here at Chief Charlotte, and uh, Micah and Reese are sending Aaron to uh, Valley Christian, and, and it seems like it's going well. Each one of those boys is glad to be going to school. Jeff and Mary Lee sent uh, their daughter off to Whitworth, and Kelly and I sent Ryan off to the land of blue and gold. We... Uh, think things are going well. I uh, called Ryan on Labor Day weekend, and uh, I asked his permission to tell this story. You have to do that when they get older. Uh, 
Uh, in our family, generally it means uh, permission and then a lunch is involved if they're in a story. Uh, so I called Ryan on Saturday, Labor Day weekend. It was 11 o'clock. I figured he's up by then. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Pretty good. What are you up to? He's a man of few words. I'm watching SpongeBob and cooking eggs. I said, oh, great. Uh, Anytime my boys watch Spongebob, I told them their mind would turn to mush. Don't do it. Um, And then I said, do you have anything to compliment the eggs? Any kind of meat? And he goes, Slim Jims. (laughs) I guess you don't have to deal with the grease. You just digest it uh, with the Slim Jims. I don't know where they learned that. I I don't think he learned that from his mom. But hopefully uh, his professors are uh, passing along some better life skills than Spongebob and Slim Jims. Back to school. We're going to school on Jesus and how he prayed. Andrew Murray was a Scotsman sent as a missionary from uh, that uh, island to South Africa in the late 19th and early 20th century. A prolific writer, one of Murray's works was entitled With Christ in the School of Prayer. Through these three messages that we're uh, looking at, we're spending time with Jesus in the school of prayer. And what have we learned so far? First Sunday, Reverend Robbie took us to Matthew one thirty-five, which tells us, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And from this, we see that prayer was a priority for Jesus. It was one of the first things on his list. And even though he'd been ministering and pouring his heart out and extending himself emotionally and physically, spiritually, prayer was something that filled him up. He needed to pray more than he needed to sleep. Last Sunday, Pastor Jeff took us to Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 to 27, where we learn that God delights in us as his children. For who we are not for what we produce. We're God's children. That means we belong to Him and He belongs to us. And no matter how the world might grade us or how it might give us a score, God delights in us. It's interesting how stages of life help us learn more about God. And I remember one of my uh, college roommates had a child before I did, and he said that he was learning so much about the father heart of God through his child and being a dad. And I've learned so much about just that aspect of God by being a dad. And it's been a a great privilege and joy in my life to have children and to watch my boys. I find them quite entertaining. They give me pleasure. When they were little, I used to poke my head in the door and just watch them sleep after we'd uh, gone through a bedtime routine and just watch them uh, sleeping peacefully there because everybody's an angel when they're sleeping, all right? And I also love to just watch my boys eat. And they can eat. And uh, I called uh, Ryan on Wednesday to get permission to tell that story. And I said, you know, we're starting to miss you. Is it okay if we come down there and see you? And he said, well, are you going to take me out to eat? <laughs> Why would I derive pleasure in watching my boys sleep and eat? Perhaps it's because God has used me in their life to be their father And I derive joy from knowing the fact that they're protected and they're safe and they're sleeping and they're provided for and that they're eating. And God has given me the ability to provide that in their life. God's our Father and He delights in us in the same way. Imagine He just enjoys watching you sleep and watching you eat and go about your day. He delights in you because you're His children. He delights in us not based on scholarships that we win or promotions that we earn or a sales quota that we meet or perhaps winning a certain percentage of a market share. He's our Father, and He delights in protecting us and providing for us as we will keep seeing in the passage that we have this morning. Matthew 6, 9-13 is entitled The Lord's Prayer for most of us. It's on page 960 in the Worship Center Bibles and I'd like us all to turn there. Uh, just, we're going to read it all together. So page 960, Matthew 6, 
9 to 13. Perhaps you have it memorized. Perhaps you grew up in a liturgical church that uh, you prayed this often. And perhaps your family um, practiced praying this. But I'd like us to read it together. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I grew up with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like us to just pray as we uh, embark into this study. God, I almost feel like I should take off my shoes because this is hallowed ground. Thanks for uh, Jesus and how he showed um, what it's like to have you as our Father and he showed us how to pray and just pray that you would uh, use me and the thoughts that I've gathered for today. May it be a blessing to each one of our hearts. May your kingdom come and your will be done through this time today. In Jesus' name, amen. This prayer of Jesus is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching, and it's interesting, it's in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. If you take the time to just read it aloud, it takes about 20 minutes. He begins uh, the prayer by, you know, Matthew 5, he begins preaching, and it, it simply says, Jesus opened his mouth and taught. And then the conclusion of that sermon, it says, the crowds were astonished because he taught with authority. This prayer is within the context of that sermon. And in the prayer, Jesus directs it to our Father. His Father, our Father. And if you're one to circle or mark in your Bible, you might note that between Matthew 5.43 and Matthew 6.18, the word Father, Jesus uses to address God 12 different times. Interesting number. 12 disciples, 12 tribes, 12 times that he makes an allusion to his father. I did a little studying this week. I was wondering, how many times has God referred to as father in the Old Testament? I found that God is only referred to as father in the Old Testament 15 times. So here within these verses, we're, we're almost matching that. In the New Testament, there's a decidedly different turn with the appearance of Jesus the Son. Jesus came to show us the Father. Father is the favorite way that Jesus would address God. The the term Father is used 65 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in John's Gospel, John was a very intimate disciple with Jesus, a friend of Jesus. He uses the term over 100 times. Paul goes on in his epistles to use the phrase over 40 times, In blessings, praises, doxologies, for instance, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to show us that we can have a very intimate relationship with God the Father. The Greek word is pater, father. It sounds very similar. But in Aramaic, you can almost hear a child mouthing the words, Abba, Papa. Daddy. It's a term of endearment. Think of those close relationships you have and the, the terms of, of endearment that you use, the pet, pet names that you give to uh, a spouse or to a grandson or daughter, um, sweetheart, honey, sugar, sunshine. You fill in the blank. It's because we love that person and then we're close to them. And sometimes it might seem odd when we're at a restaurant and this lady who hardly knows me starts calling me hun as she pours my coffee. Something's a little bit off there. It's a picture of intimacy, of family and belonging. Jesus is giving us a glimpse into the kind of relationship that he has and that we can have with our Heavenly Father. And that's how Jesus begins the prayer. Our Father in Heaven. Jesus is teaching his disciples and us how to pray. 
And you can see in the verses before that he's telling them, don't pray for show, don't pretend, don't go into lengthy or flowery prayers so people can say how spiritual you are. Instead, go in private and pray, and this is how you should pray. And Jesus, in teaching this way, it's not so much a formula that if you do this, X, Y, and Z equals this, or repeat this certain phrase and magic will happen in your life. It's more of a pattern for prayer. I don't think Jesus was telling us to repeat this particular phrase over and over, though we can. I think it's more of a a pattern or an outline or a structure on which we can fill a lot of body. There are several times in the New Testament where it mentions to us that Jesus went out and, and spent the whole night praying. The whole night? Do you think he'd run out of things to say? Well, perhaps if he was using this outline and filling it in, I can imagine that he would be able to spend the whole night praying. The pattern seems to have five parts, which uh, we'll break down. But those parts are adoration, surrender, supplication, confession, and preservation. Let's begin with uh, the first, adoration. Jesus begins the prayer relationally by addressing the Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your name be revered. Instead of God's being, name being hallowed or revered, God's name is so often treated in our culture society with scorn and derision, contempt. God's name is profaned. Just think over the course of your last week and how many times you heard the name or the word God and Jesus and how many times it was hallowed and how many times it was a curse. You ever stop anybody when they say Jesus in a profane way and say, hey, you're talking about somebody I love. (laughs) Try it sometime. Might make for a good conversation. Jesus is entering the Father's presence with adoration, with praise, with worship, and reverence. And when we enter into prayer, we should remember where we are. We're coming into the throne room of the King. We don't run, we don't swagger, we don't strut, we come in humbly. And we kneel and we bow and we wait for him to extend the scepter to us. We remember how great he is and how small we are, that we're his humble subjects. Adoration places God on the throne of my heart and reminds me about the order of the universe. There is a God, I'm not him. We should begin our prayers with reverence and humility, adoration. Many of the prayer warriors that I've been around and we begin to pray, there's a a calming and a stillness and a, a time to wait a little bit. And then an entering into a prayer with effusive praise. Praising our Father gives us perspective. He is strong and mighty. We are weak. He is all wise and all knowing. Our knowledge is limited. He has the whole world at his disposal. Our resources are limited. The Psalms are a great place to go and praise the Lord. They give us voice to our praise. And I was thinking of Psalm chapter 8, which interestingly enough ends by saying the same thing that Jesus is saying at the beginning of this prayer. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. (laughs) When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, Wasn't that a great moon this past week? (laughs) 
What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Jesus models entering prayer through the doorway of adoration and praise. We have a mighty God. He then says, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And what Jesus is pointing us to here is surrender. Surrender. May the Lord's rule and reign extend from his throne in heaven to the earth in which we live. God's kingdom is not confined to geopolitical boundaries. His rule doesn't stop at a shoreline or at a mountain or at a river. God's kingdom is the rule and reign that he has in individual hearts. Make no mistake, God will get his way. Scripture is replete with this idea. Here's one verse, Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So it's, the question isn't whether or not God is going to get his will and his way. The question is whether you and I are going to surrender to it. So often we have our own agenda, which is usually about our will, our way, with the faulty belief system that somehow we're in control. So much of the stress, anxiety, and conflict in our lives comes from the fact that we're contending with others and contending even with God to make sure that our agenda gets accomplished. Instead of surrendering, we want our way. We like to be in control. We don't want to give it away. We're contenders, and I don't mean that in a positive sense. We need to be careful because sometimes God turns us over to ourselves. When he destroyed the earth in Genesis, he said, my spirit will no longer contend with man. I remember being a a youth pastor, and and one of the things that I thought was a great idea was to take uh, students on summer mission trips add a little adventure in there, and boy, we'd fill that van. And wouldn't you know that the uh, first couple of years we did it, nobody would sign up, and I'd get maybe three or four. And so I started getting frustrated at students and mad at parents that they didn't support me and what I was trying to do, and it came out. And a good friend of mine stopped me one time, and he said, Dan, are you more concerned about your will or God's will? gives you the right to ask me that. Um, It's a great question. And so I begin to think about this, and I just need to surrender that. That I want good things to happen in students' lives, but it's up to God and His Holy Spirit to do that. Not, Not my plans, not my agenda. And wouldn't you know that two or three years later, we trotted out the idea again, and the bus filled up, and it became a a, a regular feature of our youth ministry that, that was anticipated and we told stories about and, and God did it in his time. But it took me surrendering that, surrendering my will and my way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It speaks of surrender. Jesus, may you rule in every heart, including mine. And friends, we don't surrender to Jesus just once. It's something that we have to keep on doing. This uh, week, I, um, one of the nights this week, I woke up about 2.30 in the morning, had to go get a drink, and I just couldn't get back to sleep. My mind was filled with anxious and dark thoughts. Went out to the kitchen table so as to not bother my wife and started to journal and pray, and I was just restless and All of a sudden, this thought came to my mind, well, you've been studying the Lord's Prayer. Why don't you try it? And so slowly, I began to just work through it, and I 
came to the part of thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I just realized that so much of my anxiety was about the things that I wanted to accomplish and that if they went well, it would make me look good. And God, you, you rule and you reign. I'm just going to be still and know that you're God and that you'll get exalted. And you're my dad and you're going to take care of me. And what didn't you know, I started getting tired again and went back to bed and just saying to myself over and over, my father's got it. He's in control. My father's got it. He's in control. And pretty soon I was back to sleep. After adoration and surrender, Jesus says, Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus models the making of requests and petitions before God. The pattern of prayer is supplication. And this might sound like a very old fashioned King James kind of a word. But it means that we're simply asking God to supply our needs. When Jesus says bread, he's referring to all that we we need to sustain us for daily life, not just food. It's it's a good habit to wake up and uh, lay out our requests before the Lord and say, here's what's on my heart, here's what's on my mind. Psalm 5, verse 2 and 3 says, Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the, Lord, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. Give us today our daily bread. It's just the habit of going to God and saying, these are the things that are on my heart and my mind. I, I just need you to come through for me. So see, these are some of the prayers that were on my heart this week. God, help with the first test. God, heal a sprained ankle. God, give me wisdom in leading others. God, help the check engine light (laughs) to go off in my van. And it did. (laughs) How does that happen? (laughs) Help my children to follow the Lord. Help my kid to not grow out of his shoes before he's worn them out. What's on your mind? What's on your heart? Please note, give us this day our daily bread. It says it twice, daily. It speaks of moment by moment, day by day, dependence upon God. Wouldn't we all like to win the lottery and be set for life? But what would that do to our hearts? Wouldn't have to depend on God anymore. We'd have it made, just got enough in the bank, and live off a trust fund. Matthew 6.34 says, do not, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about Self. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Remember how God provided manna in the wilderness? It was just enough for the day. God has made us to be dependent upon Him, to be humble. And please note, it says, Give us this day our daily bread, not our daily steak. Those steaks good. We're asking God for simple provision. Sometimes I wish I was more like my dog. Not worried about much, just where the squirrels are. He eats the same old dog food day after day after day. And I don't think it ever goes through his mind, you know, what the level is in that five-gallon jug in the, in the garage. He just kind of knows that dad's got it covered, mom's got it covered, they're going to feed me. Would we just rely on our God like our dog does on us? After adoration, surrender, and supplication, Jesus moves into confession. Something he doesn't have to do, but something he shows us how to do. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus didn't need to confess his own sin, but he sure had ample opportunity to pray that God would forgive those who uh, sinned against him like he did on the cross. Confession works in this manner. I let God do inventory over my life, my words, my actions, my attitudes, my motives. It's kind of like a virus scan, looking for malware. I ask the Holy Spirit to show me where I've offended Him. I ask His conviction to go to work. I acknowledge the wrongs I have done, what I've committed, and I ask forgiveness. Psalm 139, 23-24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
And when God shows us those things, we move from there to 1 John 1, 9, which says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As I was studying, I was using thesaurus.com and typing things in. I typed in confession. The antonyms for confession are denial or concealment. Proverbs 28, 13 indicates that it doesn't go well when we conceal. Whoever conceals his sin does not prosper, but who, the one who confesses and renounces it finds mercy. And as we find mercy, as we receive grace from the Lord, the Lord wants us to do the same. He wants us to give mercy, to give grace. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And in the same way that it's good to do an inventory of our own sins and acknowledge the things that are inappropriate and disobedient, it's good to, to acknowledge the, the sins of others against us. As pastors, we sometimes have the opportunity to hear the burdens of other people. They come into our office and they tell us about what's going on in their lives. They trust us with those things. and It's time to get out the Kleenex and sometimes the wastebasket to go with the Kleenex. And, you know, oftentimes we sit there and we listen and at the end of it, just unbearable things that happen to people. And about the only thing you can say is, I'm sorry that happened to you. And wouldn't you know, oftentimes people's response is, oh, that's okay. No, it's not. It's not okay. That was wrong. That was sin. That hurt you. And we need to acknowledge that it was sin and call it what it was. And that was sin against me. That was wrong. It hurt me. And that's when we take that to the cross. Because that's what Jesus died for. He didn't just die for my sin, but he died for the sins of the world. And sin harms us. It's good to take that to the cross. And as we receive forgiveness, we also give forgiveness and let it go. Adoration, surrender, supplication, confession. And then Jesus wraps up the prayer, the pattern, by praying, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the, uh, from the evil one. Um, it, de- it depends on your translation. Some say deliver us from evil, some fr- from the evil one, which would indicate Satan. This is a prayer for preservation. God, keep me safe. Keep me safe from myself. Keep me safe from making harmful decisions, from having bad attitudes, from having impure motivation. Matthew seven thirteen and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. When I hear that, those verses, I get a picture of a two-lane Montana highway somewhere out in the hinterlands of West Dakota. Um, Anybody been to West Dakota? Those highways just drop off. Why did they make them that way? Is is it so the snow will blow off? I mean, there's just ditches that if, if you went off, if you cross that white line, you're a goner. In so many ways... That's what happens to us. If, if we don't stay on the straight and narrow with Jesus, we're a goner. There's a lot of death and destruction that can come our way. and We're asking God to preserve us. Heavenly Father, keep me on the narrow path. Keep me walking with you. Keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. Help me not to make choices that harm me or harm others. Preserve me. I find it interesting that right after Jesus finishes the prayer... He goes right back to the admonition to forgive others of their sins. I wonder how much temptation in our lives isn't so much go do this or go do that or take this in, look at that, or as much as it is in unresolved conflict, bitterness and anger in our hearts that we, we don't let go. This, this idea of for, forgiving others is, is a big part in our life. Well, as I was preparing this message, the thought occurred to me on a number of different occasions, this is just really basic stuff. Learning how to pray. But that's why we had this series, to remind ourselves to go back to school and relearn the basics. 
Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for being a father to us and showing us yourself through your son Jesus. You're so great and good. I praise you today. Holy is your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done in our hearts. May we surrender to you and what you're doing. Lord, provide for our needs and uh, just keep us humbly dependent upon you. Living with you, walking with you, talking with you, letting you know our cares and burdens. Lord, I pray that we would live lives of uh, short accounts with you that we would do business with you on a regular basis and confess our sin for you, for, uh, with you. And Lord, I just ask that our hearts would be f- free from bitterness and hatred and, and uh, strife. I pray that we would uh, love one another deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. And um, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would keep us from temptation deliver us from evil keep us from harm I pray that you would help us to believe your promises, believe that you're good and trust in you and obey you and love you in that way Lord thanks for this time to be together this morning under your word Uh, you're so good to us in Jesus name